Well, we are in the fifth week of a series that we've been going through, Discovering God. And uh, I really hope that over these weeks that you've had opportunities uh, to begin to discover God, maybe or rediscover God in a new way. The problem is this is the last week, and if you haven't gotten it after five weeks, I can't help you anymore. The discovery is over, and you have to find out for yourself. But, uh, but really, what does that mean? You know, when we make a discovery, it means we found something we didn't know existed before. And in our discovery, we find all of a sudden this information, clarity, and understanding that was previously unseen. And we saw in Luke's gospel today the difference between the Pharisee and the tax collector. And here, the Pharisee had all the ritual right. And here, the tax collector really felt he had nothing to bring. And they both had a knowledge of who God was, but only one truly discovered him. And the one who discovered him, discovered him in his humility. Discovered it as the ability to humble himself. That he now met God in a new way. And the way we discover God will only happen if we're looking for him. And if, if you're not looking, you won't find him. But if you're in a place of where you're searching and beginning to open your eyes to see, you're going to begin to meet him. You know, there, there are several things that we've been going over that's to assist us on our journey to discover God. And the first thing that we said is you're going to have to have focus. And why is focus so important? Because I promise you, whatever you're focusing on right now in your life is the most important thing for you in your life. Whatever that is, wherever you're putting your resources, your time, and whatever that focus, that emphasis of focus is, that's what's most important to you. Well, if we're discovering God, our focus starts with centering our life on God. That's how we begin this redirection. We center our life on God. And then our perception should change. And perception of God is we're discovering through a life of Jesus who God is, that we're having this discovery now because of who Jesus is and revealing to us now that we can understand more of who God is. And then that's going to take diligence on our part in our discovery. That, that diligence is doing our part while also remaining in the faith and trusting in God. And then last week we spoke about a pathway and, and the importance of that. And all a pathway is, is the direction that leads to our destination. That's, that's a pathway. What does your pathway to God look like right now? I, I can tell you for me, my pathway has looked a lot like this, kind of squiggly lines at times. But there is this clear path that's to lead us to a discovery in ways that we didn't know before. And we actually saw in Job's life what that, that pathway looked like. Remember, Job wrestled with God. And, I, and, I, and I'll remind you that, you know, sometimes we're going through difficulties in our time and, and we're wrestling with things and we think that we're wrestling against the enemy and evil most of the time and all this opposition. But what if, in fact, you're really wrestling with God in some things in your life? And we saw that in Job's life. And, and the pathway of wrestling for, 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 for Job was kind of showing us that there's going to be this, this suffering and a trial, but it leads to blessings. So, so on that pathway, we're going to have to overcome suffering. We have to overcome trials, but we have to trust in God's promises and his blessings that he would give us. So, so what happens when we discover God? What's next? How do, how do we respond to what we discovered? And we read in, in 2 Timothy, Paul's letter in chapter 4, that he's telling Timothy, now that you've discovered God, that you understand, now that you've discovered who God is in your life, you have put your faith, your hope, and your trust in him. So what he's doing now is he's reminding Timothy, but, but now he's going to charge Timothy. And in chapter 4, we see this, that, that Paul's charging Timothy, here's what you do now that you discovered God. Here's the things that you need to remain in doing. And, and the first thing he says is you need to remain faithful in God. Remain faithful. The second thing that you're going to need to do is continue to proclaim the gospel. Then he says, the third thing you're going to need to do is defend what's true. Defend the truth. And then finally he says, here's what you'll continue to do. You evangelize to everyone. That, that you bring that message to everyone. 
That means that there's a response in what we discovered. So our discovery needs to lead to an action. Christianity is not passive. It's interactive. It's the ultimate virtual reality. That, that it's something we're to participate in. And Paul encourages him. He says, remain in faithful living and, and service as you anticipate Christ's return. What he says is that they, they believe that that promise that Christ will come again, that he's going to judge the living and the dead. And he says, what I want you to do is remain faithful. Keep on serving in what you've been directed and prepare yourself as if Christ's return is imminent, that, that at any moment. And maybe that's something that could help us on our discovery of God, of God. What would that look like? What does it look like if I told you I know for certain that Jesus is coming again in 30 days from now? What, how would you respond? What if I told you I know for certain Jesus is coming back in seven days? Because he's coming back. And he's either coming back, he's here, or he's coming back, close my eyes, I open him again, and there he is. But what if I told you Jesus is coming back in the next 24 hours? What would you do? Would, would, your, would all of a sudden what we find you know, important change? Would we redirect our pathway? Would we, what would we do if we believed that to be true? How do I respond? Well, Paul's telling Timothy this with that expectation, expecting that return at any moment. So he tells Timothy, Preach the word, and he says, do it in season and do it out of season. In other words, always be proclaiming the gospel in everything you do. Always. In everything you do, proclaim the gospel. Well, well, well why? Why always in everything I do? Because here's what happens. Proclaiming the gospel declares God's authority. It's bringing correction and encouragement. That's what happens in that truth when we bring it. The proclamation of the gospel, what it does is it creates growth, it creates maturity and perseverance. Now we know the source of the gospel message is the word of God. And Jesus Christ is adequately and completely revealed throughout all of the scriptures. That that becomes revealed. So when we proclaim the gospel, we're doing the work of the evangelist to witness to the world God's judgment of sin and his offer of grace and salvation. That's the message. That there is a judgment of sin, but there's an offer of grace and salvation. And that's why we need who he is. And that's this message that, that is, it, it, it's not our words, it's his words. It's not our truth, it's his truth that's, that we're called to proclaim. Now, some of that proclamation of us is just living our lives as a result of who we've encountered. The gospel message is the story of your life, of, of what's different now that you've discovered God. What, what's happened? What I can tell you what's different now is that God completely redirected my life from where I was before I knew him to where I am now. Amen. And you know what? I'm really grateful he did. Amen. And I've been on a discovery ever since of trying to know him more. Now, Paul lived his life as a witness since his conversion. By, 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 by his journey on earth at this point is coming to an end. So he's lived this life of faithfulness, but he, he knows it's coming to the end. So what we do know, and scholars will tell us, this is the last of Paul's writing. It's not Galatians, Ephesians. You, you read all these books in the New Testament that Paul has written. But in fact, 2 Timothy chapter 4 are the last words he wrote before he would be executed for his faith. And he knew that. He knew it was coming to a close. That's what we can read in these texts, what he's telling Timothy. He knew that his existence in this life was passing on. And I would imagine, I was thinking about this earlier, well, what letter would we write if we knew things were coming to an end? We'd want to share what's most important with others. We'd want to pass something on to our children, our grandchildren, to our friends, our family, our neighbors. We'd, we'd want to say the things that would be most important for them to hold on to. So Paul shares, and he says this in 2 Timothy 4.6. He says, 
For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. He knows it's coming to an end. And being poured out as a drink offering was both a Judaic and a pagan ritual. That's what it was. It was actually an offering that you would literally pour out a little of your drink over an altar or, or, or as a sacrifice. You're making this sacrifice. And the idea of pouring that out is saying, I'm making a sacrifice. Paul saying, it's being poured out. It was a sacrifice to God. And Paul, what he's writing down, he's saying, my whole life has been poured out like that drink, offering my life as a sacrifice of God. That's what he tells him. I've offered, I'm, I'm being completely poured out my whole life. Then he continues on immediately. And he says this. He says, verse 7, I've fought the good fight. I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. Don't we want to say that? Don't all of us want to finish well? Don't all of us want to come to that place of of finishing, knowing it's complete in our hearts? Paul's discovery of God, you see, was not just information, it was transformation. And, And it was Paul who brought this discovery to Timothy. But there's a response required. There's a response required to our faith, not just that we believe, but also that we're called as a people of God into an action. See, Paul says, I fought, I ran, and I remained faithful. I want that written on my tombstone. I fought, I ran, and I remained faithful. My family might add some other things, I'm not sure, but (laughs) hopefully not. Um, I fought, I ran, man, what a statement. I fought, I ran, and I remained faithful. We respond to what we believe with an action. We do it in other things in our lives that we so firmly believe in. We respond with an action. And the first thing we must realize, if, if we, we recognize that we have to fight, run, and believe, that we, we believe that, that the first thing we must realize is, where's the fight? Where am I fighting? What I can tell you is most of us are in the wrong fight. We're fighting in the wrong battle. We're fighting in the long, wrong place. And although we have conflict in the physical, the battle is always spiritual. It's a spiritual battle. And in Ephesians 6, 12, it says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. See, the wrestling against flesh and blood is the struggle of humanity. And we get caught up in the wrong fight. We're over here arguing and trying to make a difference or or being caught up in these these battles. And what Paul's saying is, I'm going to teach you not how to fight the battle. I'm going to teach you how to win the war. And this is how you'll win the war. See, the real battle is our spiritual struggle against the evils in this world. That's the real battle. That's the fight we're facing. So Paul says there's three things that you can do to take action in your faith. You've got to do these three things, Timothy. Be encouraged. God is with you. But be encouraged. That that same letter and message is continuing for us as a people of God today. That that should be just as real as it was then as it is now for us that we take that message. So he says fight the good fight. And what he's saying is pursue God's will and a life of faith. Fight. You're going to fight the fight. You've got to pursue God's will and live a life of faith. So what does that mean? If I'm going to fight the good fight, here's what it means. It means run from sin. Run. Turn from it. Run. And then pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. That's how you'll fight the good fight. That's how you'll have victory. That's how you'll overcome that battle. That's how you'll begin to war, uh, win the war. That you're going to learn to fight these principalities, these powers against rulers in dark ages. And when we learn to fight those things, you'll see that we overcome. Second thing he says, you've got to run a race. And if I'm going to run a race, what that means is that I commit to God's purpose for my life. That you've got to commit to God's purpose for your life. 
That's the only way you're going to run the race. You have to understand, what does that look like? What's that purpose? Because if I don't have a purpose, I don't have a place. But God's called us to a place in, in a relationship with who he is. And for every person who's in Christ, for every person who's been created by God in his image, has a purpose. The question becomes, did I discover God to begin to live out my purpose? And how do I do that? Well, your purpose is meant to bring glory to God your whole life. You're his reflection, and that means you should bring him glory. That your life should be poured out like a sacrifice and bring him glory. So our goal is to claim that eternal prize, that we could run that race knowing what awaits for us in the hope of salvation. The third thing he says is you got to keep the faith. And that means that I'll persevere in all that God has called me to do. That I won't quit. That I'm not going to give up. But that I'm going to keep the faith. I'm going to have perseverance. Regardless of the obstacles. Regardless of the opposition. Regardless of what I'm facing. Regardless of the diagnosis. Regardless of the struggle. Regardless of of my finances being difficult. Regardless of the struggle in my relationship. Regardless, regardless, regardless. I'm going to keep the faith. And I'm going to persevere in all that God has called me to do. So that means you have to be firm in your faith and do not waver. See, our discovery of God requires a response. It requires all of us to move into a place of action. That we can't, we can't be swayed by the temptations of this world. Now, next week we're going to begin a new series. And it's building a future and leaving a legacy. And this is really important. That we understand what does that mean for each of us. To build a future and to leave a legacy. And we can look at Paul's life. Although he didn't start off well, his redemption led to him leaving a legacy. His Damascus Road experience led to him to pass on the faith. How do I know that? It's 2,000 years later and we're still talking about Paul. I hope 10 years from now someone remembers me. 2,000 years later, the impact he had was to begin to build a future. To begin to believe in leaving a legacy. You know how he did it? He poured it into other people. He poured it into Timothy and to Titus and to those who gathered around. He poured it into Luke. He poured it into their life. When his life was poured out, it was poured into something. It was poured into those who would keep the faith. of those Because Paul knew the work would continue until Christ's return. And that there was an action on earth that had to continue. And that was making his kingdom known. That was bringing his kingdom to earth. Church, the Lord has a legacy plan for each of your lives that we can have an impact for generations to come. So what do we do about it? Fight the good fight, run the race, keep the faith. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Well, Father, we know we can't do any of those things without you. We wind up fighting in the wrong place. We end up running away from who you are and we wind up doubting our faith. What I can tell you right now is you can discover the Lord in a way that you didn't know him one minute ago. And that's to have a relationship with him. Well, what does that mean? Well, you're hearing the gospel message. The truth is being proclaimed. Well, now I have to turn. I have to repent because I've tried to do it without God. I've done it in my own way. I've sinned against him. But because of his mercy and his kindness and his grace, there's redemption. And if I repent, I can return now and I can come to a relationship with him not just to have my life back, to have a whole new life. Be a new creation. And I don't know where your heart's at or where you're on this journey. Maybe you need to discover, rediscover. But I want to offer you a prayer and you can pray it from your heart and you can meet the Lord in a way that you didn't know him before. And today could be the beginning of that discovery. So if you'd like to pray with me, you could just repeat this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I thank you for dying on a cross for my sin. I open my heart. I invite you in. Take control of my life and make me the person you want me to be. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, if you prayed with me, here's the most important thing. Just let us know. Why? We're committed to a pathway of discipleship. 
You're going to discover God's purpose, God's plan, and God's power being made known in your life. Amen?